Hello, Tom Doherty here. We're going to get started right at the top of the hour. So we're about a minute out. I trust everybody can hear me. Got one yes. Okay, good. Mm, so no, I can't hear you, Annie. So there's a call in number, Annie, or you can use VOIP. All right, so it's 11 o'clock, and I appreciate promptness, so we're going to get started here. So I'm um, working okay. I can hear you. Good. I'm reading the chat box on the left here of my screen. So I'm located in Spokane, Washington, Triple Points in Oak Park, Illinois. I handle the Western states for Triple Points. Um, I've got a lot of slides to go through, and I'm going to spend a few seconds on some and maybe a minute on others uh, to get to this approximate hour presentation. Kind of eclectic background, a, a MBA specifically in sustain, sustainability. So I do a lot of life cycle analysis stuff uh, in the wastewater space where I've been the last 15 years. I am a licensed wastewater treatment plant operator. It's just be 100 degrees here today. Um, terrible stuff happened in Houston, but uh, hopefully our federal government, and local, everybody will continue to support uh, as the locals are with boats and all that sort of thing. Um, so quick agenda. Oops, go ahead. We're going to talk about Mars aerator, uh, aeration and basins, bubble size, how that works for rehabbing. I'm going to show you a couple slides of computational, computational fluid dynamics, talk a little bit about nutrients, and the interesting part I think is going to be the case studies and Q&A towards the end or along the way. I'll try to keep an eye on the questions. This next slide has nothing to do with the presentation. I just thought it was a cool slide to see if everybody's awake right off the bat here. It is um, some researchers in Australia trying to capture methane, but uh, onward. So in the lagoon space, um, there is around 6,000, some say 7,000 in the United States. Depending on what EPA you look at, uh, there's about 20,000, 18 to 20,000 NPDES permits uh, including uh, all all plants, all cities, LA, uh, Corvallis, Montana, et cetera. So about a third of them are lagoons, so a lot of lagoons out there. Now on the industrial side, there's about 100,000 permits out there, and a lot of those are, are lagoons as well. 
So we'll cover a couple of things about industrial uh, rehabbing as we move on here. So um, particularly what I want to focus on here initially is what we have seen and what others have seen is you know, basically aeration efficiency. It, the way we've done it uh, for years uh, has been surface aerators, and anytime you see um, splashing in the air like this, uh, you've got a lot of utility going up in the air. I'm going to note here the sound is muffled. I'm going to try to get closer here and, and fix that. So anytime you're making splashing like this going up in the air, the utility, you know, the people you pay the power bill to are winning. You know, you get some DO and some mixing little action on the top, but a lot of that's just wasted utility going up in the air. Um, I got this in an email within a couple months, this photo and it actually promoted a new efficient sort of aeration, and maybe it's application specific, but that's, that's really tough for me to see that energy throwing water up in the air like that. Again, you're gonna get some benefit in that upper one foot of the water, but uh, a lot of power to create that energy to throw that water up in the air. If you got a 12 foot base in there, that's a tough duty on um, getting towards the bottom. So along this presentation, I'm going to have a couple different slides. It's just quick hitter lagoon tips. And this is for the operator in you or the engineer that might see some uh, stimuli out there. But according to the EPA, this item number one, short circuit is the number one cause of lagoon issues, you know, sludge buildup. Uh, item two, cattails will not grow unless there's accumulated sludge. So it's just quick, you go up to a qu quick read, you go up to a lagoon, you got cattails going around it you know there's, it's got accumulated sludge in it, which is causing short-circuiting. Uh, item three, add bullhead catfish to mixed pond. We've seen that in uh, some downstream polishing ponds. Um, we'll be able to show it later in the slide. Uh, the, what's behind that is in a more shallower polishing pond, you can stir up humic substances, get them up to the upper 18 inches where the sun can work on um, um, it, doing this job. Um, okay, hang on just a second. Somebody says we're only seeing your title page, not seeing your slides. Uh, let me see how many comments are saying that. So is everybody having a problem with the slides? Uh, they're not seeing the slides. Same problem here. Another guy says, I see the slides fine. Um, no problem, all good, all good. Might be a local connection then, is if we're working and getting through out there, um, then it might be a local issue. So I, there's nothing to do on my side. So I'm, I will uh, continue, there we go. So item number four, lagoon turnover. That's when solid turnover in the bottom generally comes with when there's a temperature change in the environment. And lagoon turnover is often equivocated with odor issues. And uh, finally, well-behaved lagoon will gain about half inch of sludge per year. Just some quick hitters. So one of the things that we've been able to deploy out there and really turn around some tough looking situations uh, with lagoons, with solids and cattails and all that stuff is this sort of aerator that um, this, this fine bubble and coarse bubble aerator that triple point markets. And I'm going to talk about that for just a second as we move into um, bubble size and case studies, et cetera. So on the inside here, the static chamber, there's a coarse bubble. And that's really critical for mixing. Mixing is incredibly important um, in a lagoon environment or any wastewater treatment environment, whether it's a concrete basin, lagoon, or whatever. And then the long tubular uh, devices here are fine bubble EPM membranes. So that's where you're getting your uh, oxygen transfer and you get some oxidative power when those fine bubbles first hit the uh, water surface. So here's some of these units just getting ready to deploy into a pond. Uh, they've got a tether inside them with a buoy so we know where they're at. They are connected by a weighted air hose that uh, goes from a header out to a location within the pond. I've got a, another slide here that depicts that uh, a little bit better. 
So if I had one slide to talk about this particular uh, error rate, it'd probably be this one, because this, there's a lot going on in this slide. Number one, we're going to have a blower up on land going to a header that can be buried on top of the land out to a manifold. And that manifold is going to feed these aerators with the coarse bubble mixing, the fine bubble oxygen transfer by this flexible weighted air hose. And you can see in this instance, we do a lot of wet retrofits from a floating vessel. Uh, not always a nice fancy raft like this one with a little crane. You could be pulling this up here to do maintenance on it, which has really resonated with a lot of the operators. Uh, or it could be placing it. Um, I see a note here too, if anybody's having uh, trouble with the slides, uh, reload the page and the slide so it should operate correctly. Um, so again, the flexible weighted air hose is bringing a lot of the party here because we're not having to drain the pond, put in subsurface laterals. Um, it will go over an undulation and bend uh, over a bump or what have you, but it is weighted so it stays flat. And again, you can raise this up here and do maintenance on individual unit without taking the whole system online. Each uh, manifold has a separate ball valve that goes to each one of these diffusion patterns so it can be operated independently. Um, what could be shut down as an example like this one is for maintenance. This is just how some of that flexible weighted air hose looks like when it arrives. So it literally is uh, you know, on four by four pallets, a 200 foot per section, 600 foot total there. It really is uh, afforded some installation advantages. So in the aeration business and aeration space, again, we're thinking about rehab and lagoons here, it's all about pounds of oxygen per horsepower per hour. Okay, so if we look at a typical mechanical surface aerator, we're on the order of two and a half to three and a half pounds of oxygen per horsepower per hour. And by contrast, we come up here and let's say let's look at a fine level diffuser, we're on the order of six to six and a half pounds of horsepower per hour. So almost a 2x situation of uh, efficiency uh, right here. It reminds me of a recent location in Nevada we just installed. They had 60 horsepower surface aerators, and many were failing um, and or having a lot of maintenance issues with them. A lot of operators are not fond about going out on the pond and deragging those or dealing with the uh, power lines going out there, kind of spooks them. And we ended up putting in 30 horsepower positive displacement blower, blower versus the 60. So there's a pretty good delta savings there, efficiency. Uh, savings. So this chart uh, it again looks at that, that Mars area, the coarse and fine level aeration, and now we're going to add the depth of the lagoon on the lower axis here. So anywhere from um, you know seven feet on up to the teens, you get some pretty good efficiency with that particular unit. And again, you can see a high speed surface aeration um, or coarse bubble down here, high speed right here. Surface aerators don't do too bad in more shallower water. They reach the bottom a little bit better. But a big problem we see with surface aerators is um, you know, 11 and 12 foot ponds. Um, and it, it just, they just don't have the efficiency. And it, it's hard to reach the bottom and therefore you get the short circuit in between the, uh, the wave patterns. So a couple more uh, Aeration 101 slides here. Aeration can, and this is true in a lot of places, um, it'll balance pH level, reduce CO2 emission. Um, DO, especially when it arrives in a fine bubble form, is known to kill sulfate-reducing bacteria. SRBs are evident in fecal material. Um, DO can transform metals such as iron and manganese to oxidized state, allowing them to be removed or settled to the lagoon floor. Um, another quick note here from a guy I can't see. I, I would advise you to reload if you cannot see uh, the slides, because most are seeing the slides. There's, it's something local. This pond on the, scene, on the screen is just a lack of oxygen, algae, algal mass on the top uh, there, and oftentimes could be rumored. This would be a typical rehab situation. The pond is looking like that, and, and you can go out with the fine bubble diffusers particularly uh, when they're implemented on the floor of the basin, allowing that, those fine bubbles to slower, slowly move upward. 
uh, brings a lot to the party. So again, DO is known to oxidize dissolved contaminants, including H2S, which is a uh, comes from SRBs we talked about in the previous slide. Uh, efficient addition of DO can cause certain chemicals to be more effectively utilized. So a good example of that would be uh, disinfection. A lot of times if you've got uh, fine mobile DO in there, you're getting a lot of E. coli reduction as an example, therefore potentially able to use less uh, chemical and disinfection. And if you've got adequate DO, it just gives operators a lot more options for uh, managing their pond. And generally, we're going to target two milligrams per liter DO to have a healthy lagoon system. So pretty important slide here, the next couple slides. So if we look at bubble size and kind of get into the hood forensically here, if we're looking at a cubic foot of space, uh, on the left would be you know, a great big basketball. I mean, your basketball is nine inches, so say it's a 12 inch standard basketball. But the surface area of that is going to be about 4.8 square feet. So that 4.8 square feet can interface with uh, contaminants, constituents in the water, and cause um, uh, some oxidation when it's first introduced into the water. Now, if we go to the middle uh, picture here, uh, that's more likely a coarse bubble. And when we say coarse bubbles, we're talking about four to six inch bubbles, literally. And so now you jump up to 185 square feet. So you've got a lot more surface area that's doing things, that's creating current, that's transferring DO, or it's oxidizing contaminants, such as the iron, the manganese, the H2S, the SRBs we mentioned. Now we take it a step further and let's and look at what would be representative of a fine bubble. And now you've got 1,800 square feet. Now, when we say fine bubble, and I say we, I see that's the industry. Triple point uses that. But it's pretty much industry speak. You're talking a one eighth to a quarter inch, so very small. But you're getting the, the all the oxidation power and the oxygen transfer by the significant amount of square feet. A quick note that somebody switched to Google Chrome, and now they can see it. Uh, that's a, a good point. Google Chrome, I think, works a little better than Firefox this particular uh, delivery mechanism. So bringing a lot to the party here when you, when you use fine bubble, and back to using the fine bubble and chorus bubble combination to get the mixing oxygen transfer, it, it really allows us to clean up some um, tough looking old ponds. So just a couple quick slides. This isn't an AOP uh, session, but this is AOP oriented type of chart. So if we look at the oxidizing power of chlorine, a relative oxidizing power, oftentimes it's measured in millivolts or something, but just looking at a relative oxidizing power from uh, Runter, it's one. And so oxygen, which is an O2, is 1.02. And if we jump down to ozone, it's at 1.52. It's just, that's an O3. It's just got that extra molecule hanging on there. Permanganate, hydrogen peroxide, hydroxyl radicals. Uh, I mean, we know what ozone is actually used for disinfections in locations. So getting to be a very powerful oxidant here. On down below, we would have um, some other iron chemistry, uh, Fenton's reagents, and other things that even get even more. So the point here is oxygen is a very powerful uh, nature's oxidant, if you will, uh, when used correctly and strategically uh, to clean up water. So this slide will um, speak to that oxidative power. This, this is not um, wastewater. This is frac flowback water. And this is up in um, Utah. And the point of this is the foam. Because when we turn this on, there, this is a 12-foot pond. There was nothing in it. Uh, it had some hydrocarbons, which were mostly scavenged out before it got to this state of affairs. We had a lot of, like, BTEX. We did a full volatiles and semi-volatiles before we uh, turned this aeration on. You can see the big diffusion patterns in the background. But when we turned it on, we're hitting surfactants, anaerobic bacteria with all those tiny bubbles I was showing a minute ago on another slide. And it is oxidizing the dickens out of that stuff. And this is, this is shaving cream foam. This isn't just some big bubbles. This is shaving cream foam. And we were actually concerned about going up over freeboard and causing a spill there. But I told the site operator that we need to acclimate through this, but we're, the best thing, I mean, worst case scenario, we shut the power off, everything subsides, but then we'll start over trying to acclimate. Well, it did power through at about the three to four week mark. It took that long in this pond because it was quite thick, nasty stuff in the bottom that we just chewed through with those fine bubbles and started to really clean this water up. 
I will also mention this was in 2014. Oil was $100 a barrel. By December of that year, it fell to 50, and the site abandoned the project. They were interested in creating water, cleaning it up enough for downhole reuse. And that's where they were going with this project because these were just evaporative ponds. They were try, trying to take in more and more water because they would scavenge additional hydrocarbons, and that was their their business model was was making money off the of hydrocarbons. But the point of it's the power of the oxygen bubbles released in a very nasty environment and really oxidized that stuff and really started to clean water up. This is just another view of the same thing. This this foam right over here is pretty thick. This is a fresh startup. As a matter of fact, within this month that we're in, I think this is the very first week or two of, of uh, August, uh, happened to be out in Minnesota, and it's a sugar beet facility, so incredibly high CODs. I mean, we're dealing with some that are up to 40,000 milligrams per liter COD, so it's like pouring juice in there, more or less, and that's kind of what it is. The, the processed water has a high value of, of this this uh, beet juice, and this these Fine bubbles, again, sitting on the bottom, releasing nine inches off the bottom, or just chewing that stuff up. And, and odor control was a real concern here, but they're cleaning this water up enough to potentially give them options for wash down water and certainly land app, uh, which they were doing prior, but um, they, they might uh, open up some new opportunities for use in plant by getting a, a cleaner level of water. So that's it on the oxidation. So another quick hitter lagoon tip. So if I showed up at a location, and I did this recently down in um, Colorado, um, I, I want to know, what are you, what's your BOD in coming into the plant? What is it out of the first cell? What is it out of the second cell and the third cell and so on? Um, and so we have to do some lab testing to really get our arms around where um, the ponds are. Uh, another uh, item, too much sludge will push treatment downstream. And... That reminds me again of that trip to Colorado. These guys were getting 25% BOD reduction in the first cell and about 40 to 50% in the second cell, which goes against uh, standard design where you're looking at maybe 80% reduction in the first cell. Um, and that's what happened. They had too much sludge. And the number one pond was starting to stink. They didn't have enough air in it. And, and I think they're working on um, trying to change that. Another uh, small town trick that I have seen is use a trash pump to skim high DO water from one pond to another. In a location in California, it's got a polishing pond that's getting eight, nine, ten DOs in a polishing pond, and he's only got half a part in his primary aerator lagoon. And they don't have any budget yet. They put in a few of these uh, aerators from us, but they need quite a bit more than that. So they would actually, certain times of the day when that, that DO peaks, they just He's a trash pump, and they pump water right back to the front to try to make use of their DO. He's also the same guy that uses the catfish down there. He had to get that cleared through uh, Fish and Game and whoever, but he is doing that. Adding aerations can help defeat solids build up. We'll show that in case study. Algae, when they're evident, usually live in the upper two feet. This slide has nothing to do with nothing, but I thought it was cool. I bought this from the Museum of North Idaho in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, years ago, and this is circa 1930s uh, mining district, and this guy would come out of the house and go over to his commode and do his business, and the river would just carry it away, and it was ingenious at the time, but pretty much can't do that anymore. So here's a couple slides on computational fluid dynamics. I'm going to buzz through these quite quickly. I want you to take notice of the little picture of the aerator in the middle of the, the pictures upcoming. Uh, some of the assumptions on this simulation, 12 feet, um, you know, simulation time is looking about 18.5 seconds as an example, and, and we can come back to some of that. But So we'll see this aerator, and what, what's going to happen here is we're going to slice this aerator multiple directions and try to see where is the mixing coming from, where is the water coming from. In this instance, the graph, the blue is a slower speed, red is a faster faster speed uh, as far as um, the fluid dynamics. So there we slice it one way. Now we're slicing it um, a little closer to the center, now we're a foot outside and continue to look at the, the patterns. And, and this, this is, uh, it's cool, these are cool uh, slides. But we've just taken a look under the microscope forensically on where is, where are we mixing? We know we do this. We put it in a pond that's got a high BOD and somebody wants a 30 or a 20 out the back. We can model that and put it in. 
but how is it mixing? And so we've done this work. And now we're going to go outside quite a bit farther, one meter from the center, and where is, where is the fluid pulling from? And it's just interesting to look at these things. And I don't know a lot of folks that get into this to try to really understand their product. Now we're going to go two meters away from it and take a look at where the flows are, where it's drawing from, and then three meters. And then now we're going to cross section it a different way and, and take a look at the flows and then move out in successive uh, views and out to the ends of the uh, diffusers. Um, here's just a different kind of a color view that shows suction paths going into that static tube, which is not shown in this view, which is hollow on the bottom. So it's designed, we want to pull water up through it. Uh, another kind of uh, colorful view of it, it looks like modern art or something, but shows um, streams coming into the area um, Kind of the same thing here. We're pulling from a certain area. We're lifting. It's pulling through that static tube and, and pushing up. And we're only looking here at the uh, center tube only. We're not looking at what's going on with the tubes out here, the, the diffusers. And I think I've got another slide or two on this. And and again, this is what uh, simulation. Now, now, this was just, uh, we don't have the final report from this firm that we hired to do this. And so I just stole some of the slides on the initial report that um, they sent to us because I think they're cool and it kind of shows really what's going on down there. So moving on, um, when Triple Point looks at a, a lagoon rehab or helping meet permits or upgrading, um, we usually turn key to, from air, unless they have existing air, we'll use existing air if it, it's got the right um, you know, specifications. But here's two 40 horsepower blowers in this instance. And, and here the city, this is also, this is in Nevada. Um, they just put the header out along the dike here with had ponds on either side. And this still left them room. You can see some tire tracks here backed up, but they could still drive a UTV down here as an example. Pressure release valves. And these are just uh, one runs and one's uh, redundant backup in this situation. Um, this is another site, also in Nevada, that they have a very narrow, narrow top of the dike, and so they buried the header. And so here they've, they've now put in the second header that was stubbed in, and it goes out underneath. It goes back to those manifolds, again, that we showed in an earlier view, and then to the flexible weighted air hose out to the aerators in the pond. And occasionally, we'll get into a, uh, a green field, actually more often than not, not just occasionally, but relatively often, a few times a year, we'll do an entire greenfield installation where there's laterals affixed to the bottom, as an example. And they still like that flexible weighted air hose because from an operational standpoint, they can shut down just one line, lift this unit up, change out diffusers, and put it back down in without taking the whole pond offline or having to drain the water down. Um, this this happens to be a site out in Michigan, and they put in a lot of these aerators. It was a combination city and dairy, dairy water. So I think the last of these lagoon uh, tips, but sludge judging, uh, you need to take you need to grid and stake and take multiple samples when you're going out and trying to find the, the solid depths of the pond, um, not just one in the middle here and there because it, it can be different. You'll have different sludge uh, depths at different points on the ponds, and that's relevant to what what aerators you might have on the top. If you've got surface aerators, you're going to have some voids kind of underneath where the current reaches down from the, the propeller, as an example, on that aerator. But if you go in between it and the next surface aerator, you might have a quite uh, tall amount of uh, sludge. So you have a sludge profile worked up. Oftentimes in lagoons, and we see this again, again, headworks upgrade may be best for a lagoon. The flushable wipes, the oxymoron of the 21st century, um, a fix and whatnot, just, uh, they don't biodegrade. And it's just piles up, piles up. I've got a picture of that a little bit later. And key here, back to when I talked about solids build up or short circuits, understand design HRT in today's HRT. Anything that impedes time will impede performance. But item five, uh, so some engineer designed, you know, a site back in the 60s or the 70s. These ponds should have a cumulative, so say, 24 days of hydraulic retention time and find out that it's really only 8.2 days. And that happens slowly over the years. You know, a lagoon, by, by design, the day it's 
open is, is going to be doomed to fail from the standpoint of solids build up. Maybe it's 15, 20, 25 years initially, but the solids are going to have to, to come out. And as operators change over the years, they're chasing different things. And really what's happened is solids build up, reduces volume, reduces HRT, changes treatment. One of the things we mentioned toss in oranges, it's another poor man's trick to literally find out, put orange in because most of it goes under the water, and you can watch the current, put it in where the influent is in your pond, and time it. Watch where it goes. And you can learn a lot just by you know buying some oranges and throw it in. And that, that bottom bullet was, uh, there was just a pan, pond in really bad shape. You can do a dye test, it's a little bit more uh, bendy, but a little bit more scientific. And um, it really had zero residence. I mean, two hours and 45 minutes, it, it came to the other side. That, that's, that's a tough uh, situation. So from an O&M standpoint on these aerators, um, an operator, this picture, I believe, was taken at a pulp and paper plant. So I would get in the white. Normally, you just have kind of a bubble up, just like in a mountain stream. You just, you just got your aeration pattern. So what an operator would do with regard to having an installation like this is he would just make these rounds. He would look and say, okay, I got 12 80, or 14 or, kilowatts. Or, or, or 20 or however many, and um, if he's got that many diffusion patterns, he's good. If he has an unusual pattern, let's say that something is um, restricted somewhat, he can go over to that ball valve and bump that air repeatedly or turn it off and turn it on um, he can actually turn some of the other ones down and force more air to that one to potentially dislodge a biofouling or potentially a, a ragging. We see very a minor problem with ragging around the actual diffusers themselves because it creates kind of a vortex down there where the plastic bag, you know, coming into it by current gets scooched around the side and, and, and we just don't see the, the ragging on the actual uh, membranes themselves. Um, if you do have, if you can't, change that diffusion pattern, then that unit would have to be pulled up and, and the first line would be to pressure wash it at you know, 20 inches and it, that will clean that up. There's just a close up of a ball valve that operator would interface with. It would go over and maybe turn this ball valve on and off and observe the diffusion patterns or t turn some other ones down to force more air into the one unit and see if that wouldn't solve any sort of a diffusion uh, problem pattern problem. Just another view of some manifolds and layouts. Um, here the site um, used a T and a, a little nipple and a, and a 90 right here to keep it from rolling and just use gravity to hold it rather than having to, to secure it with any other method. Uh, one, another thing about the one the coarse bubble is, is a typical coarse bubble diffuser that's inside the static chamber we can see right here. And um, that's the same sort of thing. If we're getting uh, not a good coarse bubble pattern, then that can be clean. But it's also a it's like a twenty five dollar replacement item uh, for this unit. So a lot of folks ask about pond liners. You know, if I got clay or I got HDPE, or I, I want to go set this. I don't want to put no hole in my liner. So a couple slides on that. So these things weigh about one hundred fifty pounds. We actually add concrete to the legs so it will not float. Um, when it's on the bottom of the water, it's reduced down to the 30, 35 pounds range due to buoyancy. And the pedestal area is spread out enough that you're, you're really down to a very small amount of weight per square inch. So sitting on the bottom, you've got your spread out over uh, all this area. Here's a, a tape measure. So I'm looking at a good 17 inches that way nine inches that way, so we, we've just not found it to be a um, problem. We've never damaged a liner, and there's no scouring with regard to a clay liner as an example, and that suction coming up through the middle chamber. It's rather a gentle suction. You know, we're not broiling water through there. It's kind of, we're just handling um, air rather gently, just enough to create the current, create the oxygen transfer, create the mixing. So a couple case studies here I mentioned uh, earlier. So here's a little location in Corvallis, Montana. And um, they were aerated lagoon, primary aerated lagoon, followed by secondary partially aerated lagoon, followed by polishing pond, and then out to constructed wetlands. 
the exit from the polishing pond had fell to 0, 0.0 DL. He, he was looking for five, uh, or, I mean, for two milligram per liter DL. And um, so it just kind of slowly, slowly migrated. This picture to the right, we did not take when we were there. This is his primary lagoon, and he's got diffusers affixed to the bottom, and he has no screening. I mentioned a minute ago, sometimes Headworks upgrades the best thing for a lagoon. So they pull this down once a year and get in there, muck it out, and clean, clean stuff up off of these uh, cables, and the only way they can change the diffuser is to draw this down. And they really like these, these aerators. We end up putting some of these in the polishing pond, but it, and they also got a grant for it, but on their next grant, they're gonna, they would like to upgrade this over here and, and quit taking that down. So back to the actual site. So we installed this thing on uh, March 10th of 16, and it was 11 foot depth. And I'd asked the engineer there what he thought, what the depth was of the sludge in that polishing pond seen in the picture here. And he thought it should be about 12 inches, but we went out and did multiple so they didn't have one, and I actually bought one and, and, and give it to them. I had left it at the site even. But went out with the operator and took several of these samples. So you can see the graduations, one, two, three, four foot. So quite a bit of sludge. So we re-sludge judged it some 40 days later, and it had fell down to 14 inches, back to that foaming and that oxidizing. Now, when he... When he was only getting zero DO, I mean, it's well known solids will consume DO. So he thinks his solids is down here at this one foot level when really they're right here. And just over time, more and more solids were building up in there. And so he lost his DO. He also was getting in the constructed wetlands at a monitoring pond, he was getting nutrient spikes higher than he was getting out of uh, his pond number two. And what we theorize and he believes he's getting what's called benthol feedback where these solids, uh, nutrients will store up in the solids in their release, you know, like in batch, if you will, and he gets this higher nutrient level. So uh, they will solve all the problem. In a month's time, he's generating 5-DO. Now they time it on and off um, four hours. And so this is, they bought a little Home Depot shed um, here is a little header coming out of the shed going to a manifold, and here's a little 10 horsepower blower. They didn't want the weather enclosure because they were going to put the, or a sound enclosure. So the interesting thing is um, on the lessons learned side of this is we're up there and paying attention, getting everything started up and going, and barn doors are open running fine. Well, well I'm staying in the hotel over this location in Montana. They closed the barn doors, and, and that evening everything – shut down. The electrician had to be nearby because the engineer called me at the hotel and said uh, it shut down. I wouldn't even call you, but the engineer or the electrician was there. He went up and he flipped it back on and it just shut back down within within a few minutes. So what happened is, you know, it didn't have enough uh, cool air or ingress. And this is just what comes from Home Depot and they ended up cutting out some holes over here and putting some vents in. But the system was doing what it was supposed to. It was generating too much heat because you're sucking all the fresh air out of here. The heat would create an amperage. over amp condition reached its 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 point and, and shut the system down. This is another view of the same site. Uh, these guys built their own little raft. Right here, you see this flexible weighted air hose attached to this aerator. And we go out and mark some stakes around the pond and just triangulate where these are going to drop. They're 10 horsepower blower. They only had we've got a six port manifold. Six aerators were dropped in out here, and so here they are getting ready to go. They've got a little battery right here, the little Minn Kota motor, and then they keep this little boat for maintenance. And frankly, the operators had a fun time building this because as an operator, you just do the same thing every day, but now you're gonna build a boat. And they had an extra little crane they borrowed off one of the city trucks and, and they put it back on the city truck. Um, but this was kind of cool, this small town Montana. Lagoons are basically small town America and just, just solving problems. It was a, it was a fun little job. <laughs> Well, so at that site, this is kind of cool. And again, small town America, they want a DO at that particular site about 60 feet before the effluent weir in the polishing pond, and he wanted a five feet depth. So the engineer built this little raft, put a Tupperware inside it with like a Hawk DR 4000 or 9000 or something, and um, he lowered it down at five feet. Then he gets on the corner of the pond. 
um, and has guys walk around with the rope, and so he ties it off. And it'll record for about three days of DO values once over several minutes, and then he pulls it back in and opens it up and gets his unit out and plugs it back into the battery, and he's got his cool little portable SCADA system. Um, so here's a, just a view of a surface aerator and the diffusion pattern uh, of the mar relevant to height too. I mean, the, the deeper the water is, the broader this diffusion pattern is. And, and here's where oftentimes you can end up with your your short circuiting uh, when you compare against a surface aerator, uh, as an example. And if you've been around this business for a while, um, you're going to see the bone yards of uh, bearings and motors and pontoons and cabling and stuff from surface aerators. It's just kind of um, nature of the business. So another uh, location, La Grand Oregon, had lateral. I don't have a cool picture on this, and I don't want to launch these YouTubes because it have a tendency to crash the program. Um, they had coarse surface laterals force bubble surface laterals on a 400 by 400 foot um, primary pond. And then it goes into a massive 15, uh, 15 acre pond, very big pond. I, I always tell people how big the ponds are by how many people can water ski at the same time. I probably water ski four or five people at the same time on that pond, as if you're really going to do it. But nonetheless, their dehode belt is zero. In order for the balance of that 15 acre pond to work correctly, they wanted to be able to DO coming out coming out of that um, primary cell. They also did not have a screen. I think they had a, uh, they, they were, they're testing screens. They also took raw septage right into it. They actually had a place you could back up and dump it right into it. So they had a very difficult uh, amount of stuff in the bottom of that pond. And I thought, hey, if we're ever going to plug these things, we're going to plug it now on startup. That was there a startup, and when we turned that thing on, um, just the black clouds of ethyl methyl death coming out of the bottom of that, and the flushable lights just shooting up out of there, and you know that was in back in 2015, and it's just cranked and yanked. As a matter of fact, the city had in-house money to put in about half of what we recommended, and um, they were going to do the second half the next year, but it's done so well, they've kicked that can down the road for two summers now. I don't think they're going to do it again this year. Maybe they'll do it in 18. But they got the DO after firing the system up, up to 1.2, and as high as 1.8. So they've been kind of holding at 1.2. And we have some very cool, um, I think we have this on, on, at our website, some drone footage of flying over that during the startup, the bubbles coming on. Um, I think you can see that on our website, tpenv.com. And then um, this is an interesting one, and I throw this up here because now we're dealing with a pretty significant level of, of BOD. And, again, it's just going to be, you know, Metcalf and Eddie, 1.5 pounds of oxygen per pound of BOD, and how efficiently can you do that? You know, do you need nuclear-powered things to get that in the water, or how, how efficient can you be? So here we have 400,000 gallons a day of muni and a million of dairies, roughly 1.4 million uh, gallons a day. This is the local economy. Um, the water out of this location goes to part of the time uh, goes to NPDS and part of the time goes to irrigation. So they actually have a uh, phosphorus limit there, too, that they, they deal with uh, themselves. But the design was 30 milligram per liter BOD. So that thing is now, uh, this is just a green field. These are aerators stacked up on top of each other on pallets. This is a good way to put this in. Massive header in the background here. And this was like 400 of these, over 400 of these, these aerators for the, for, the, for the loading and the, the flow rate. Uh, it's the same uh, area we've been talking about, coarse and fine bubble. It comes nine, uh, air is delivered basically nine inches off the lagoon floor, and they've maintained that. And, and just a note also about uh, diffuser EPDM life. We see a municipal unordered seven to ten years. Once you dump that thing in the water uh, outside of, you know, a two before or something that got in and, and, and broke it or caused, caused some sort of a problem, if you're a regular municipal, that EPDM is going to last a long time. We know folks going 10 years, but the realistic thing to plan for is 
you know, some seven to 10 year window. Maybe we'll learn more data later. It's a 10 to 12 year window. I, I don't know today. But these guys are at the five year mark. Now they've got a lot more recalcitrant stuff in their water, a lot of calcium phosphate. It's really uh, you know, an interesting color when it comes in. As a matter of fact, they dose ferric chloride at the headworks to beat on the phosphorus a little bit there. They dose it midstream and they also dose. Uh, ferric and some filtration at the end to keep their phosphorus polish to to discharge limits as an example. So a lot of a lot of iron in there as well. But they're just now starting to go through and change uh, diffusers on these at, at about the five and a half year mark. I think they've seen a little bit of a, a slowdown, which could be a biofouling or long term issue with um, the various chemicals in the water. Now we've learned enough to say, for example, in pulp and paper. That's probably more going to be like a year, or they're going to have to be uh, some sort of a chemical flush, because there there are such recalcitrant chemicals in the pulp and paper water. You're not going to sit there for seven to ten years and not have to do something with those diffusers. Um, but that's just the the nature of those types of waters. Here's another little one that was really a fun little job. Just back to the case study. This is near Gallup, New Mexico. This was a private pond held by an individual that had a significant enterprises this is in Navajo country and he had two pond system in and uh, he was his complaint was odor they were basically facultative ponds and he wasn't getting enough water depth in it and they started stinking pretty bad so we ended up with this three horsepower and the smallest little blower you can buy he had the stub power in here a simple on off button to this blower he runs a little blower underground, comes up over here to this little manifold he put in, kind of off the shelf ace hardware type of parts, and um, put in four of fine bubble only aerators, which I haven't spoke of yet. But when we see waters under six feet, we will go generally or recommend fine bubble only. Because back to that coarse bubble at four to six inches, those still rise pretty quickly when you're under six feet. This guy was four and a half feet. So we did a fine bubble only, just a little star pattern, you had little small aerators. And you know, a month later, this is a diffusion pattern, it was a mole overlooking here, equidistant spread in this pond. Um, solve these problems, solve these air, he's pretty happy with it. He's talking about he's starting to build up more uh, depth now. It's targeted to be uh, a little bit deeper, and he's got a second pond. And if he needs to, he, he's got land out, but he, he hasn't generated enough water here with his private enterprises, a convenience store, a restaurant, uh, a bunch of retail operations, uh, some housing for some of the workers. He employs a lot of the Navajo folks there. So that was his own little pond. So he couldn't go to the ratepayers, and he was happy to be – he was out the woods for under $20,000 on, on this whole thing, so he was pretty happy with that. And this is just interesting. This is also near Gallup. Um, he didn't have a way to take these aerators out, so I counseled him. I said, well, you buy some swimming pool noodles, and he bought a little blow-up raft and taped these together, and I rode with him on the boat, and which had no propulsion, so he parked the pickup on one side of the dike and another one over here tied a rope across, and we used the rope to go hand over hand out to the location where we wanted to drop the aerators. They've already been placed. And we got the aerator on this and towed it behind the boat. I was out actually in the boat with him, help him drop it and turn everything on and go. And so it was, that's a real satisfying job to, to help somebody out like that. Shifting gears, here's an example. We think this is pretty interesting. This is Eagle Sewer District, and this is near Boise, Idaho. This today right now is a 2 million gallon a day facility. CH2M Hill has done the, the, the PER and the study on this thing, and they're shown by 2040, 5.6 MGD, kind of banana belt climate, massive retirement. And I, I, cause I ask them, where is all that flow coming from? I would be able to somewhere in Montana, and they'll lose 50,000 gallons over a year or something, and this is going the other way exponentially. And they say it's just retirement. But the bigger point is this facility right here, these ponds will go to 2.8 MGD at a low reach capacity. So they're already building, they've got the, the plan all in for more ponds over here. So the contemplation that's really interesting is if there's ever a case to go to a mechanical plant, this would be it. We're talking about 5.6 MGD by 2040. That's, that's a lot of water and today's 2 MGD. So really up and to the right, but 
they like the whole, they put our system in. This is an installation and in later in September now. They, they're using all these aerators. They're going with it. They think that, um, you know, they're not just the poor guy in the middle of, you know, 500 population Montana. They're pretty sophisticated folk, and they can keep this very clean, keep the solids down, and um, hit hit their limits that they're looking for and just stay with the lagoon system. They, you don't have to have advanced operator uh, you know, going to operator two, to a three, or what have you, in order to operate this, they like that, and that that is a, a fair point. In with multiple engineers we deal with, I just had one a month ago in Oregon where the engineer said we need to remove nutrients, and th the first line of defense we're going to look at multiple manufacturers is if it bumps our operator up to the next level up, it's going to get set aside. We may have to come back to that but we're going to set it aside for the moment because the guy's been the operator for a long time there and he doesn't want to take tests and we don't, doesn't pay enough money to go out and get somebody else higher uh, operator level. And that, we hear that refrain quite a bit. I know one location in Nevada, the operator, he, he just, he can't pass these tests and the circuit writer signs off for him on any NDEP uh, things that needs to be signed because he's he's a licensed operator and it's just kind of the way it goes. And he's in the middle of nowhere, he's not going to get anybody out there uh, at a higher level and pay. And if he can't get his test passed, and that's just that's just the way that ball bounces. But kind of an interesting case study here, staying with lagoons. So that's just uh, Locksaw Brigade Cam. That's an elk and C1. Uh, Self-explanatory. Make sure everybody's awake. So a couple slides here on how we would rehab and, and deal with the, the small town America that's suddenly looking at an ammonia limit. So I'm gonna do a handful of slides on this and, uh, and wind it up. So what is ammonia? Um, I, I'm gonna to go to the simple version right here. As long as we eat this and do this and clean and have an industry, we're gonna have ammonia in the water. Ammonia is a toxic, ammonia is top. It is, uh, for example, in the state of Oregon, they, and, and most places are going to be like this that are putting the limits in. You're looking at the long-term uh, temperature recordings of the stream and the occurrence of salmonid species. So if you've got a cold stream and you've got trophy fish, you're going to see a lower limit. It isn't, I don't think it's if, it's when. Now, um, using all known and available technologies and this sort of thing and funding mechanisms, maybe that takes years and years, but... The fact of the matter is we are seeing the lower ones now, um, and we're seeing those as the big drivers because it is tough for fish in the field. But um, nonetheless, we we have a system that I'm, I'm going to point out here that's a bolt-on, almost a tertiary type thing, that helps a lagoon um, remove ammonia. So nitrification converts ammonia, converts it to nitrite, then to nitrate. That's kind of known in the literature. And so what we're going to do, leading up to the slide here that shows how we go about it, is we're going to look at all the things to support, whether I'm in a uh, trickling filter plant or where I'm at, the things that have to occur for us to nitrify are going to be these. BOD needs to feed the nitrification process somewhere around 30 milligrams per liter. Most literature is pretty clear on that. It's hard to nitrify. You've got 150 milligrams per liter BOD in water. So the water's got to be cleaned at least to the point where you've got 30 milligram per liter BOD and then nitrification can thrive. Second thing is takes aeration. Just like a 1.5 pounds of oxygen to remove a pound of BOD, it takes 4.6 pounds of oxygen to remove a pound of ammonia. So you've got to have plenty of air. Okay. Item number two. Third thing, and you see this this particular slide is probably in every slide or a PowerPoint or a lot of them. It likes neutral pH condition. So we like to, um, as many processes like a neutral pH condition or 7.5 to 8, slightly higher than what others might think neutral is, but uh, relatively neutral. Third thing is nitrifier mass. So if you have a ladder on the end of a dock that goes out into a lagoon or even just a pole that lays down and you pull it up out, you have all that fuzzy stuff on it. That's basically attached growth organism. It's basically nitrifiers trying to attach to something. So you need surface area. 
because you get some natural nitrification uh, in a lagoon with the temperatures right, but you need that surface area to be able to really remove the level of, of ammonia to really nitrify it. So you'll get stuff going on the slopes, the baffles, the aerators. Uh, it's, it's that fuzzy stuff. It's a touch growth organism. So you need that. Um, and then you need temperature. And if, if I only had one slide to talk about, the, and this is just area, this is just uh, nitrification 101. This isn't indigenous to triple point or anything. This is just the way the world works out there, physics. So let's look at the axis on the bottom. I'm in December, January, February. I'm traditionally cold. So where is my ammonia value? It's up here higher. And this is not uncommon to see this up at, in the 30s or the 40s. This, this particular data set happens to be a pretty well-behaved lagoon. So it starts to get warmer down here in March, April, May. Now my effluent value uh, for ammonia starts to come down because I'm beginning to naturally nitrify. So May, June, July, I'm enjoying pretty good time through here. And then it starts to get cold again, so my ammonia is going to go back up. Ammonia, nitrification basically has a theoretical bottom at 39.2 F water temperature. So if it goes below that, you're going to have no nitrification. It's just going to end. And it gets kind of slower down uh, to that. You know, molasses downhill on a slow day will still, on a cold day, will still move, but it moves pretty slow. And you can see the temp fluctuation here. The interesting thing, though, is that as a new permit value comes in and looks at maybe something like this, then how do you get there? But this is overall the phenomena that's going on in a lagoon year-round or, or even in a, any, any sort of a plant, but the temperature swings, the effluent values for ammonia. Um, so how do you control those five things? Um, again, they're BOD you know, pH, we talked about toxins, something that could get in there, but any sort of toxin, heavy metals, arsenic, whatever. You need all these things to uh, have nitrification. So what Triple Point has done uh, is create an MBBR system, and it's basically tertiary, and you know, that's why we put the snow here to emote the cold. So we're going to run all of the water through these units, these MBBR units, and create nitrification. So we're going to control the biomass, the things that we talked about you know, early on. It's the typical media surface area. And I would mention right here real quick that we've been doing some research for two years now with a new media from, um, from a supplier that's akin to styrofoam pellets. We get some packing tank from Amazon or whatever, which is mostly has blown up airbags anymore, but somebody still uses styrofoam pellets, which I'm always aggravated when I open a package of styrofoam pellets. So what do you do with them after that? Put them in your garbage, they blow all over. you got to put them in a sack or something. But anyway, we're using that. And the, the cool thing about that is we it looks initially that we only need 10 to 50% of the media fill because they kind of expand and create all these sites. And, you know, they'll different folks have these media, so there's more sites inside, outside, and whatever. But... That's what we're doing to control the biomass is we're creating a bunch of sites. And um, we're going to control the mixing. We're going to put in the, the, you know, uh, the mixing laterals here, mixing grid. Um, we're going to control the temperature. And oftentimes, for example, out in Iowa, Missouri, they've looked at limits out there or have limits of like 0.6 milligram per liter. And we have installations out there. We just want another job at a location out there. But some of them are small enough flow. Again, small town America, they've literally used a hot water tank heater at like 100,000 gallon a day flow. If you get bigger flows, then you got to look into natural gas propane. We list geothermal. It's actually included in our little brochure picture because it, it's sexy because it's renewable. Renewable energy oftentimes open up another bucket of money uh, because it's renewable energy. So there's, we get a lot of interest in that, but of course the geology has to be able to support that. Um, and we're only looking to trim that temperature for the time of the year that it might naturally go below 39.2. So maybe we want to hold it at 40, 41. I think this next slide kind of gives a depiction a little bit better on what cost might be. Because we're not just heating a whole lagoon year round. We're heating a tank that might be 
you know, 10 by 10 or 12 by 12 by 14 foot deep. It, we, we would size that and we engineer that as part of the, the service when we're looking at the location. But based on these assumptions down here, you know, geothermal would have the most capex, but OPEX wise, would, it's, it's very inexpensive to operate. Most of the time, you're going to see a gas situation. We see electric, but that it, there's just always a question about we control all those things, but what about we can't heat up this great big tank? Well, you, you can, and um, it's not that uh, it, this is not insignificant, but if, if you have to meet a permit limit to discharge, um, you, you just need to control all the circumstances, including the heat. This one, actually, we've We've won this job, but we've literally went out and piloted this, you know, with this size of a pilot unit, and um, and they needed very low, low level out there, um, and so again back to the chart, you've got freezing, you've got influent pH, but the key thing here, in the last couple slides uh, getting to is is the delivery rate coming out was literally um, you know, near zero, um, and the same thing with you know, another location out in Missouri. Uh, we run the thing for a pretty good period of time. Uh, we got one just now starting in Wyoming. It's just setting up like next week or two weeks, probably in the first, second week of September should be operational to pilot through the entire winter because that's when you have to prove this in the winter. A lot of people can get nitrified during the warm weather, but nitrify year-round. Um, that that's the challenge, and so that's what we're able to. That's what uh, Wyoming, the Wyoming location, wants to look at. Um, this slide is interesting because we piloted at this location. So we went there in summer, uh, winter of 2015, 4100 elevation, Bishop, California. This is actually a second plant called Eastern Sierra. Ridiculously, they're two separate plants, two separate retirement systems. <laughs> they had us. At, uh, combining them as well, and, and we, we get our thing. But this is the guy that puts the the uh, catfish in. He takes the high deal off this farm and pumps it in the front where he's got half a part. But we piloted our nitrox right here, and it did not get cold enough that winter. Due to El Nino, the water temperature never went below 40F, so we couldn't get the forensic data that we're looking for. So we agreed with the public works guy to hold it over to winter 2016, and it did get cold enough. And I told the public works guy, I said, well, if you had that installed, you wouldn't have turned the heater on that year. It's kind of interesting. And then they got great data. And I'm, I'm, I need to add right here in the last uh, minute or two that we do add a sec an additional cell if we need to denitrify. So we nitrify, then denitrify. Now, this plant, 650,000 gallons a day, goes to irrigation. He's now getting more <laughs> irrigation to or, or more land with uh, alfalfa because alfalfa has the most luxurious luxurious uptake of uh, nitrogen because he's got a 10 total nitrogen limit in monitoring well. And so he's trying, that's why he does all these little tricks with catfish and the DO and, and their budget constraint. And Mammoth Brewing is going to build a new plant in town, so they put everything on hold because they're going to send them 100,000 gallons a day of high COD, then they kick that can down the road. And so... <laughs> Regulatory saying, yeah, okay, let's wait a little bit because we don't want to build a whole new plant and, or approve a new permit, and you got some curveball coming. Uh, so it's kind of a cool plant. They've actually bought a few of our aerators, and they're putting in between their surface aerators, trying to eat up the sludge down there. So uh, cool location. And we, we, we continue to work with the operator and public works guy there. So uh, the last couple slides here is we have uh, moved into um, tertiary polishing because we're seeing it more and more for solids polishing or for um, phosphorus. And so we actually OEM this from a guy in Texas and uh, actually he's in the Houston area um, right now. hope everything's okay for him. Uh, it's Title 22 approved, and we have it for a lagoon market in the States for tertiary polishing. Uh, we we see the uh, the small town lagoon don't have this cool online stuff and SCADA systems like big plants do, but prices are coming down. This is a view of a phone app, and we're actually installing some of this or integrating it in. Also, as an OEM to put instrumentation in small town. I personally carry around electrical conductivity pin because I see crack water, and I want to know TDS. I carry a little. Uh, pH and temperature that fits in my pocket. It looks like a marker pin. And I've got a deal probe that I pack around. 
But we just see this coming more to small town America because of affordability. It's just a little better than it was uh, some years ago. Um, so and Triple Point is very active, and uh, I would really encourage you to look at the websites. Their interview show that's for uh, YouTube, um, all kinds of cool drone videos. Bought a, bought the drone a couple of years ago, a very high definition and really cool flyover um, videos of a lot of these locations and more more coming, free hat for anybody that wants to sign up there. We get involved in education, did this a year ago, and, and do them everywhere. I think there's one right now at Talladega Speedway, uh, cool venues, and we help operators get CEUs. We bring in another gentleman named Steve Harris out of Mesa, Arizona, who uh, wrote a book on Lagoon experts, so we, we keep arms, arms and distance, so it's not a sales pitch, and it's very academic and so it's our way of giving back. And, and this was standing room only. We did this one at 50 in the in that Cabela's, and we had 50 people in there. So, so triple points uh, high on lagoons do it better, and and um, that's that's our hour show today. I'll preview if there's any particular questions over here, or if you have any, and you're still still with us here. Um, uh, can I get a copy of the slides? This will be available. This is recorded, and um, uh, we will make it available to the attendees. Here's another one. The audio is very bad. Oh, I called in. The audio is really good now. We'll have to let this uh, anymeeting.com uh, site know about the uh, their audio challenge. That's kind of we chose to use the phone on our side. And then uh, here's a uh, gentleman from Denmark. Thank you. Very informative. Uh, what kind of success have you been having with the tertiary filter? Um, we have great success. It's, it's all about the loading rate on that on the cloth disc filter. Um, I mean, what's, what's the solids? Where is it at? And where do you want to take it to? If it's, for example, a TSS issue. If it's for phosphorus, we will generally we'll use the alum-based uh, coagulant and um, to precipitate and then filter out. And uh, we don't get down to the really, really low levels unless we have to, I mean, if we have to go to a very low level, like 100 micrograms, we're going to have to talk about dual units or units in series. So, and it all, it just depends on what it comes in at. A lot of times the plant's looking at six milligrams per liter phosphorus up front. You get some serendipity loss or some biological reduction across the continuum, and maybe you're at a one or a two on the way out. And then what are you looking for? Let's just say if you're a one and you want to get to uh, half a part, that's that's easily achievable in one one pass of a cloth disc filter. So it would all all depend. They're, they're tried and true and been around pretty pretty good long time now, and quite a few installation reference installations to to look at. So 45 to 85, so the question continues on the um, cloth disc filter. If we've got 45 to 85 milligrams per liter down to 10 to 15 milligrams per liter, that's that's still in the sweet spot. When, when you get north of 85 and 100 and you want to get down a little lower, um, that that would be a sizing thing because then you have to slow it down or maybe you've got to have more discs or more units uh, in parallel uh, relevant to the flow. But that's all achievable. Uh, send a copy of the slides. We'll do. We'll send emails out to folks for that. Uh, and studies in Canada during the winter don't have particular uh, in Canada. Um, if with regard to the ammonia, I assume the question is. But we've certainly got them where the temperature is, is cold. Um, and demonstrate so the temperature is uh, going to be universal here to there. And there was a question about typical cost for approximate flow of 30,000 gallons per day to 75K. So I think what the question is, is what's the cost of a cloth disc filter at about 30,000 
gallons per day, or 70, 35 to 75,000 gallons per day. So one module of this cloth, this filter, um, will treat up to about 100,000 gallons a day. And then um, we would add modules, and they can go bigger too, but just say the, the one particular model will go to 100,000 uh, gallons a day, and that's that's just over, uh, depending on configuration, if we need a coagulant, you're, you're probably looking anywhere from eighty to $110,000. And, and here's, a, here's a guy who makes a comment, a webinar just on a tertiary filter would be good, I agree. That'd be something just to do as a standalone rather than mention it in one slide. Again, the, it will be uh, recorded. We'll make the YouTube available and um, send send that out. Here's another second the motion on a tertiary you know, presentation. Okay, no further questions. We're going to call out a wrap. Thanks for your attention, and uh, we'll see you on the trail. <laughs>